and help really get this in motion. On that note, just be aware that there is a microphone in this room that can pick up even things the audience is saying. So, <laughs> as we like to say in the theater, please unwrap your candies during intermission. Um, for those of you that are new with us, um, Interim Writers is a playwrights collective that is dedicated to fostering and developing new plays by Boston area playwrights. Um, and as part of that mission, we always open up the first part of our events by looking to you, the audience, to share with us what's going on in town. So if you are an actor, playwright, director, and there is an arts event going on in town, this is time for you to tell the community what's going on. What are you working on? <laughs> Cassie? Middletown, an actor shapes for project. I'm Steve Benjamin, and Greg McDermott, who is one of our accomplice writers, is an advocate. Awesome. Thanks. Yes, go see Middletown. What else is going on? Legally Dead at uh, Playwrights. Boston Boston Playwrights Theater. All right, Legally Dead at Boston one Playwrights Theater. It's one of the shortest, Theater. funniest plays I've seen in about five years. Nice. Short and funny. We all have time for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> What, anything else going on for you theater folks? Yes, yeah, you. Um, I guess next month we'll be opening uh, the first production of Hub Theater Company of Boston, which will be uh, Lebensraum by Israel Horowitz. Awesome. Yes, yeah, so uh, come support the, the genesis of Hub Theater Company. Awesome. Yes. Um, for people who are new play fans, um, Argos Theater next month will be doing their last show of the season, which is The Seabirds. It's a new play by William Oram, and it's fantastic. You should all come. BPT, opening month. Awesome. Not until, I mean, until April, um, but Escena Latina Teatro, in Spanish, but still Ana in the Tropic uh, by Milo Cruz. Awesome. Oh, yes, go check out Ana in the Tropic. Anything else? All right. Next thing that we have going on is here at the Democracy Center on March 3rd, Sunday night. We're featuring the work of three playwrights, so come check it out. Three playwrights. Um, we are doing Deborah Weiss, MJ Halberstadt, and Mike Metters. All right, so uh, with that, I would like to introduce to you uh, our playwright, John Grinner Ferris. He is a member of the Accomplice Playwrights Group. He went to um, Boston University and graduated from their playwriting program that is uh, that resides in the Boston Playwrights Theater. This play that you guys are going to get a reading of tonight was actually a semi-finalist finalist for the O'Neill Playwrights Conference. And I'd like to give a special thanks, shout out to the <coughs> actors that are involved tonight. We have Victor Shopoff, Dakota Shepard, Derek Frazier, Bob Mustett, and Gordon Jack Schultz with, of course, Ross Brown helping us out with stage directions. So, stay for the whole play. It's about 80 minutes. We're going to take a 10 minute break. We're going to drink some more wine, have some cookies. Then we're going to come back and talk about it. Your feedback is important to the playwright. We want to hear your ideas. We want to hear your responses to this play. So, without further ado, Highland Center in Indiana. Highland Center, Indiana, a crossroads in the middle of God's country, 
where the nearest neighbor is at least a mile down the road, corn country, hog farms, soybean fields, with the occasional tobacco patch and a couple head of cattle throw in for good measure. There's a farmhouse with a dilapidated but serviceable front porch over which floats a red tin roof. A couple of old chairs, one of which is Henry's worn Windsor chair, devoid of all but a few flecks of bright paint, sit on the porch. Milk cans, galvanized metal buckets, and a wooden box that contains firewood and corn cobs for starting fires are all within easy reach. Geraniums are planted in rusty coffee cans. Henry would never splurge on anything so frivolous as a flower pot. A washstand with a chipped white enamel wash bowl sits by the door. Over it, a mirror hangs on a wire with a sharpening strop hanging alongside. Chickens run loose in the yard. And over here, there's a remnant of the corner of a white picket fence that used to run across the yard at the front and would have been seen from the road. But the rest of the yard that runs back toward the house is enclosed by a rusted wire fence. The edges of the yard are packed with flowers of all kinds, peonies, rows of Sharon, lilies, ivy, lilies of the valley, irises, tulips, daffodils, honeysuckle, forsythia, morning glories, roses, all nourished by the fertile soil and chicken manure scraped from the hen houses. Lording over all of this is a barn, big and brooding, cathedral-like. And beyond all this, the immense space of the fields that lie just beyond the house. Even in the huge, cavernous sanctuary of the hayloft, I could feel this land pulling at me, trying to get me. It was here that my life was tipped over, like a milk can spilling its contents out onto the dirt. It was here my mother was buried, where JP abandoned me, where I was left, twisting in the wind. A light comes up on Alice Ann. She sits on her gravestone that's also a swing. <laughs> She sits easy, comfortably. No one told me anything. Look at you! You'd think that someone would have clued me in eventually, instead of... I don't believe it. You are so big. Oh, what? Look at you. Mom? I can't get over how handsome you are. You look just like your dad. Do I? An image. So how come you never told me? I heard you got a boat. Didn't you think I had a right to know? And he's a boy just like you. Don't be shy, tell me. Yes, Mom, Billy's a boy just like me. Well, don't say it like that. That doesn't make any difference to me. Why didn't you tell me? Tell you, tell you what? Oh, Hank, you were just a kid. You were too young to be told. Anyway, what does it matter? What does it matter? You want to know because. Because why, Hank? Tell me, why is all this so damn important? You just do. How was I supposed to know who I am if I don't know where I came from? Oh, Hank, please, you drag me here to listen to this. <laughs> Henry's dying, Mom. Oh, that's a shame. Got a letter from Grandma. Between her talking about the weather and how many quarts of peas she just put up, she said the doctor said Henry's not doing so good. Just one line. I almost missed it. If I am who I think I am, that farm could be mine. Henry will need some convincing. I want what's mine. Henry will still need some convincing. Shit. I thought you were happy. You got yourself a bow after all these years. Can't you just be happy? Don't do this to yourself, Hank. Don't do this to me. Mom, I know what I'm doing. Do you? You know what they say about curiosity and the cat. You don't think this is a good idea? No, Hank, I don't. And if I go ahead and do it anyway? Your life, Hank, I can't live it for you, but I'd hate to see you hurt. You could tell me. Right now. Save me and all of us a lot of trouble. I'm not a baby, Mom. Can't keep protecting me. I just don't think it's a good idea to go around digging in the past. No one told me anything. I've got no choice, Mom. Oh, you've got a choice, all right. Don't stand there and get all uppity with me. I'm still your mother. You're mad. You always were one who had to touch the stove to know it was hot. You're really mad. I'm not mad. Yes, you are. All right, I'm mad. It's just that the men in this family are so darn stubborn. You try and tell them this <laughs> by talking to a wall. Nah, it's no fun being a Cassandra, is it? I have no idea what you are talking about. I have to do this. Mom, it's like when I'm writing something and it's a bug and it bugs me until I'm finished and i got to get it out of my system. Well, if it's a bug, why don't you just squash it? <laughs> live and let live, isn't that what you used to say? What am I going to do with you? You've already done it. That's what I'm afraid of. It's 20 years she's been buried and I still talk to her like I'm talking to you now. 
<laughs> Not so much I miss it. I got out of Highland Center as soon as I could. The scholarship one of the better Boston schools. And I never looked back. <coughs> never had any intention of returning. Billy enters. Billy is overweight, but dressed in very modern, fashionable office attire, and carries a satchel over his shoulder, a blackberry, and a bouquet of flowers. Lucy, I'm home! <laughs> What's for dinner? I'm starved. Where were you? I called you about three times. You didn't answer. Um, I was here. You didn't answer. I was here. I know you don't want to hear it, but sometimes I think this place is designed to self-destruct. It's like people. Can we just do our jobs and leave all this political shit out of it? Look what I got. Pulls a bottle of wine from his satchel like a rabbit out of a hat and flourishes it before him. Ta-da! I thought we could have it with dinner. It goes with your lamb stew. Ah, uh, shit. What? I didn't make it. I think we're gonna... I didn't get around to it. Oh, well... Well, we can do takeout tonight. I'll make the lamb tomorrow night, I promise. Okay, sure. You can save that for tomorrow, or... We can open it now. <laughs> <laughs> Why wait for tomorrow night? Do you want a glass? I'm definitely having one. Sure, pour me a glass. Do you mind? No. We spent, I am not kidding you, ten hours, ten hours locked in a conference room. Me, Alex, Michael, Peter, Gordon. Oh god, not him. Give him his due. He actually got us through this today. Ten hours. If you total up the billable hours, my god. Ka-ching! Yeah, Gordon is really good at ka-ching. This thing has to go live Tuesday. He knows how to. He plays the game. He can put all these people in a room and get a consensus, and that's what you want. He is a gross middle-aged man in a Hawaiian shirt who hits on all the young girls, and I hope someday he ends up on the front page of the Herald for statutory rape. Look, I have to work with these people. I couldn't care less what Gordon does on his own time. He's an asshole. That asshole could have fired you instead of laying you off, and then you wouldn't be collecting unemployment and sitting here all day contemplating your navel. <laughs> I'm supposed to thank him for that? I'm just saying. Did the air conditioner guy come today? Yes. Did you pay him? Yes. I left that check. All he had to do was fill in the amount. Yes, $200. God. What? Just $200 is a lot of money. It took him about 20 minutes. Well, we have the money. It's done. I hate that. Why should we pay somebody good money to do something we can do? We don't know how to put in an air conditioner. What's to know? You stick them in the window, you close the window, you lock the window. <laughs> I'm not carrying that thing up from the cellar. I can. Okay, Tarzan, next year you can put in the air conditioner. <laughs> we pay that guy $200. I know, honey, and next year I'll pay you $300. I can put in a fucking air conditioner. <laughs> so put in the air conditioner. Take out the air conditioner. Put the fucking thing back. Oh my god! Make a career out of it! It's just... We work our asses off and we just take our paychecks. My paycheck? You collect unemployment. <laughs> Alright. Your paycheck. We take it with the left hand, hand it over with the right, and I fucking hate it. We are wasting our lives. Billy, we are simply exchanging our lives for money, and I can hear the clock ticking. I can hear the seconds dropping like... Shards of glass on a tile oh, floor. Oh, here we go again. Shards of glass. <laughs> Tinkling onto the floor. Look, I don't even have a problem with commerce, per se. Oh, per se. We don't <laughs> work. <laughs> Billy, we don't. What do you mean we don't work? I work. You know what I go for? You really are something, you know that? I don't know about you, but at the end of the day, I'm beat. I don't just sit at home on the couch with my feet up writing. God, you suck, you know that? And half the time you don't even have dinner ready. Oh, I'll just call out for something. Look, you know I have respect for your work, but don't give me this bullshit because you think I've sold out, or worse, I don't consider what I do selling out. Quite frankly, I liked trying to figure out how to persuade 18 to 24 year old men how to, bu uh, to buy underarm deodorants. <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard to figure out, just show them some tits. But Billy, we don't add to society, we don't. What do you want to do? Cure cancer? Shit. Okay, Hank, talk. You're not the strong, silent type. It's what I've always loved about you. What were you like when you were, say, 17? Are you kidding? I was fat, obnoxious, and gay. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't like this when I was 17. I saw myself sitting in a cabin in the woods writing novels, and I know all teenagers have delusions of grandeur, but... So write the great American novel. But Billy, I'm such a long way from that. I'm so far from that. It's not funny, and it's making me kind of crazy. 
So, I repeat, write the great American novel. You have the time now. Honey, we have such a nice life. People would die for it. We have friends. I'm not hurting for money. Can't you just enjoy it? Billy, I never wanted the white picket fence. It's great for you. You like your job. You come home and the house is clean. Yes, it is. Don't give me that look. It's clean. <laughs> and for the most part, your dinner's made and the groceries are bought and your laundry is done. And I don't mind. Really, I don't. This is not how I envisioned things. This is not how I thought I'd be living my life. Despite what you say, I don't think traditional in any way describes us. Billy, we are so middle class, we might as well be straight. I think it's a little late for that. <laughs> <laughs> Billy, I'll admit it. I signed on the bottom line, I agree to everything, but I want out. What are you saying? Okay. If you don't explain yourself in five seconds, Buster. The air conditioner man today? Yeah. He wanted to know if I was the lady of the house. Was he gay? No. <laughs> oh, man. I'll never hire him again. Correction, we'll never hire him again. The lady of the house. So, kind of are. <laughs> the lady of the house. <laughs> Billy, shut the fuck up. You know what I hate about this place? There's nowhere to walk. When I was a kid, you could go outside and it seemed like you could go for miles in every direction. Here you go three blocks and it's the harbor. Three blocks the other way, it's bars. You can't get away by yourself. Well, excuse me. Don't you ever just want to be by yourself? Just sit and think? You are by yourself. You are here. Why don't you take a little trip somewhere? I've been thinking about going back to India, visiting Henry. Really? I was thinking more like the cave, but that's I mean, I got the time. Yeah. <laughs> Have you heard from him, from anyone? No, not since that letter from Grandma. And now you've taken it upon yourself after ten years to go see him? More like twelve. Because he's dying. It's the decent thing to do. Scrimshaw, you know I love you, but I'm not sure you've uh, ever, ever used the words decent and Uncle Henry in the same sentence. Why don't you call your grandmother and see how he's doing? He has cancer, Billy. He's dying. Not everyone dies from cancer. They do in my family. It's your choice. Personally, I'm not so sure it's a good idea. I don't think you've ever recovered from the shock of moving there to begin with. You might start having flashbacks or something. I'm fine. Hank crosses into the yard. Billy watches from the condo. Hank is not a child, but the child. I'm not the first kid who got orphaned. I just got handed off. I barely knew my aunt or uncle. I knew nothing about a farm. I was like you. No offense. I'm taken. Mom? Here I am. I'm right here. This is your home now. Why? Hank. JP, your, your daddy, he can't take care of you. Why? Hank, please. Where's my family? Henry's your family. I want you and dad. He's my brother. He'll take care of you. Sometimes life is like that. Hey! Farmer Hanky! Hey, anybody home? Dad. Henry! Henrietta! Up back! Who is it? Oh, God damn, where the hell are they? God damn it. Hold on! I tried to think of this little yard as such a beautiful, safe little haven. The grass enclosed by a wire fence. Son of a bitch. It was here I wondered if I could quietly and happily spend the rest of eternity. Now get your ass out here! You were too young to be thinking about eternity. Parents aren't perfect, Hank. People are just doing the best they can. Oh, it's you. Uh, Henry, how are you? Is the boy around? I thought I'd stop by and see him. The boy has a name. Yes, he does, Henry. Hank. Henry. Named after you. Sister thought very highly of you, Henry. Wanted her son to have your name, not mine. Yours, she insisted. She had a name, too. Yes, she did. She sure did. We all have names, Henry. You got a name. I got one. She had one, and the boys got yours. Why is that, Henry? She was, she was so quiet about everything. It, but this happened. Well, that was the one time she put her foot down for. Her. I think my sister had a very strong sense of family. <laughs> oh, is that what you call it? Shit, I never heard her put it that way before. A strong sense of family. What do you want, JP? Uh, the boy around? I'm looking for my boy. He's at school. It's that time of day. Right. I should have known. I thought he'd be working. No, he goes to school. You said that. 
What time does he get back from school? It's only morning. He doesn't get home till afternoon. Then he has chores. Afternoon. Oh, shoot, I can't wait that long. Hey, listen, can you, you give him this? So it's a couple of dollars. Thought he could use it. I'll give it to him. How's he doing? He's managing. I appreciate what you and Henrietta are doing. You may not believe it, probably don't, but I do. Sure. Well, I'm sure he does too. I never wanted this, Henry. I, I didn't sign up for this. Your, your sister's the one who wanted kids, not me. I stayed with her as long as she stayed with me, but uh, till death do us part. You gonna visit her while you're here? Well, visit her. She's up at St. Peter's. She's dead, Henry. You talk like she's still alive. I bet you visit her, though, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah, I bet you do. I bet every Sunday you put flowers on her grave. And where are they going to bury you, Henry? When you go, huh? Where are you going to be buried? Next to Henrietta? Or next to her? She's got a name, JP. She's got a name. I received two letters, each with a couple of dollars. Then nothing. He's a good man, Hank. Don't give up on him. That time my dad came, I wasn't in school that day. I was right up there in my bedroom, listening. Hank crosses back to the condo. Wait. Wait, did I just miss something? Henry's your father? I don't know. Your mother's brother is your father? That's what it sounds like to me. You never told me this. Billy, I don't know. As far as I know, JP's my dad. So was all that your name, her name business? I was just a little kid. It was such a long time ago. Things could have gotten twisted. It's impossible. You weren't that little. You write everything in your journals. My God, if you're constipated, it's in there. You read my journals? <laughs> <laughs> Hank, this is big. You're saying he... <clears throat> your mother? Watch it. Oh, Hank, and this is why you want to go back? I don't know. Yeah, I guess. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew if I should go look for JP, continue the charade that he was my dad, ask him, see if he'd tell me the truth. You told me he was dead. He probably is. Probably dead isn't the same as being dead. But where would I look after all these years? The internet? <laughs> Henry knows the answer. Henry's the one to talk to. You really do think he is, don't you? Why haven't you asked him? Billy, it's not a question you can just ask. Hey, Uncle Henry, how are you? How are your pages? And oh, by the way, are you my father? I can't believe you. My mother! Then don't go. Forget about it, Billy. He's dying. This is it. This is my last chance. If I don't go and at least try and find out, I'm just letting things... When I said I was gay, I said this is who I am. I took charge of my life. This is me saying who I am, Billy. I have a right to know. All these years, he's never once called me his son. Now, think about this. If it's true, I also stand to inherit a 300-acre farm. Is there a will? I don't know. But if he admits to being my father, then maybe he'll also agree that that farm should not be mine. We're doing a lot better than a condo in Southie. Really? <laughs> a hog farm? It's been in my family for over three generations. Oh, well. What's it worth? How much... Could you get for it? Get for it? Sell it. How much could you get? I really don't know, Billy. A lot. It's worth a lot. I wouldn't sell it. You wouldn't be a hog farmer. I'd be dating a hog farmer. Why not? <laughs> I'm dating an advertising executive. <laughs> <laughs> Mid morning. The date is humid and lazy, but if you sit still and listen, there's activity. Red winged blackbirds call from the roadside. Cicadas trill now and then in the bushes. Even the heat has a sound. A singing in the ears that is equal to listening to one's own heart. Henry sits in the worn Windsor chair. He is unshaven and wears faded bib overalls, a long sleeve shirt buttoned at the neck and wrists, a cap advertising seed corn, no socks, and high top canvas sneakers. Next to him, at his feet, sits a mason jar with a liquid as clear as spring water. Henry occasionally sips from the jar. Within reach is a loaded 12-gauge shotgun. He has bone cancer, and he's beginning to show its effects. Hank gazes upon Henry, somewhat apprehensively, somewhat sad. When I think fondly of Henry, and I do, 
I see him driving an ancient piece of farm machinery, a horse-drawn cultivator. Its wooden yoke has been rubbed as smooth as a piece of fine porcelain by the flanks of dray horses, and its metal seat is very broad and rusted, but the springs are still lively. The yoke would be too heavy for me as a boy to manage, and would respond to me even trying to lift it like a foundering animal. It took a very strong man to handle this machine, and I still have a very image of my Henry's substantial backside cradled in the seat, his suspenders painting a light stripe down his back, and him urging the horses as they stumbled through the plowed furrows. Hia! Get up there! Come on! I could clearly hear his guttural shout in my ears. The leather reins and the horses' backs made a light noise, like water slapping concrete. Oh, don't you? Virgin might be stopping by. Jungle drums sounded the alarm, huh? Jungle drums. Ain't no jungle drums around here. I know. No jungle either. Yeah, I meant <laughs> someone told you word gets around. Word gets around. Sure. I was visiting Grandma. Yeah, I know. Right, of course you did. I cut through the locust patch, crossed a creek, and came across a field just like I used to. I was wondering where you come from. Crick up? Uh, no. No. We haven't had much rain. It's exactly like I remember. What's that? Everything. The fields, the woods, the creek. You know, the same rocks were there that I used to step on? Even the house. Look at it. It's all the same. A little run down. I guess we're all a little run down. It's really all the same. It feels the same. The house is the same. A woman from the church comes by every week and cleans it. <clears throat> Your room's still there. You're kidding. It is the same as it was? You haven't changed it at all? No reason to change it. It's all there. Your bed. The quilt Henrietta made special for you. You left here like there was an invading army coming. Henrietta left it on your bed. Thought you might come back someday. Go on in and look at it now if you want. Maybe later. Hasn't changed. Why would it? Yeah, why would it? Ah, I see you're still imbibing. If that's the worst thing I have to worry about in a day, I'm doing okay. You always said that. It's truth. Still no kidney stones? Works like a charm. Well water and vinegar. <laughs> vinegar dissolves pearls, so you figure it will dissolve kidney stones too. <coughs> you know, Henry, that's not necessarily true. I don't have kidney stones. You don't have to drink something so foul every day. Not so bad. It's vinegar. Henry spots something in the yard. He reacts quickly, picking up the shotgun, and surprisingly deft and silent for his age, takes a couple of steps into the yard where he points the shotgun straight into the ground and fires. Hank ducks for cover. Dude, got the son of a Jesus, bitch! Jesus, Henry, what the hell is wrong with you? Got the son of a bitch! Damn bull, dig it out my yard! Pete could have broken a leg in there. Pete? Who's Pete? My opponent. Jesus. Henry, you could have blown your foot off. No, that's how I kill moles. Well, then you could have blown my foot off. Shit, Henry. You always was a little bit sissy. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. That's the way you were. So how are you? That's why you're here. Because I'm going? What? I had a little time on my hands. Can't I visit? When was the last time you had that notion? I'm here now, aren't I? What do you want? A medal? Huh? Is that what you want? A goddamn medal? And you're not going anywhere. Yes, I am. What are you, a doctor now? I was hoping it was just rheumatism, but they say... It's starting in my bones now. Nothing they can do, damn doctors. What about chemo or radiation? No, I don't want any of that stuff. I've seen what that stuff does. It makes you worse. Look what it did to your mother. Maybe it could buy you a little time. Nah. It's no good. I'm rotten at the core. There's nothing to be done about it. I'm sorry. What are you sorry for? It's not your fault. Who's going to take care of you? I will. What do you think I am? Some sort of panty waste? I've been taking care of myself since your Aunt Henrietta died. It's going to get pretty bad, Henry. Yeah, well, you're looking good. You look smart. Thanks. I am good. Life is good. I like Boston. I like what I'm doing. Happy now. Henry, I couldn't have lived here and been myself at the same time. Boston. So, now what are you? The prodigal son? No. Is that what you think? You're the prodigal son? Should I slaughter a fatted calf in your honor? No. Get all the servants to blow their horns and beat the drums? No, Henry. Still doing your writing? Oh, yeah. It's what I do. I'll never stop. It's what you always liked. You used to sit up in that room and 
just scribble. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm a farmer doesn't mean I don't know nothing about writing in Boston and such. Yes, Henry. And liking what you're doing. I always liked farming. I didn't have to run off to find myself. I was right here all along. Yes, Henry. <laughs> mm -hmm. How long are you here for? Not sure. I thought I'd... You're going to play it by ear, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. You can stay here. It's still your home. Stay as long as you want. Or not. Nobody's going to make you stay. Yeah, maybe. Tell you what, why don't we go inside? I got some pork chops I can fry up special. We can have dinner. Not Thanks, Henry, but no, I, I think I'll head back to Grandma's. What? You're leaving? You just got here. Stay and eat. Get your suitcase and throw it up there in your room, and by the time you're done, I'll have the dinner on the table. Henry, I, I think I'll probably just stay at Grandma's, and besides, I'm a vegetarian. Wait. <laughs> What'd you just say? I'm going to go stay at Grandma's. No, the other <laughs> uh, I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat meat. I know what a vegetarian is. I may not live in Boston, but I still know what a vegetarian is. <laughs> you don't have to go back to Grandma's. You can sit, sit at my table and eat meat and potatoes like everyone else. <laughs> vegetarian, my ass. <laughs> then I'll take you over to Grandma's and you get your suitcase. Henry, it's just that I don't eat meat. Lots of people don't. You're vegetarian. All right, fine. I'll cook chicken. <laughs> Later that same day, the light is stronger. There's the sound of a tractor. We hear the engine revved and then the engine being shut off. Henry and Hank enter. Hank is carrying his knapsack and a rabbit in his arms, bleeding, but still alive. My God, you can see his insides. Yeah, those mowers slice him up pretty good. He's still living. Not for much longer. Shouldn't we put it out of its misery? He's so long gone, he don't feel a thing. Yeah, but still. What do you want me to do? I don't know, Henry, shoot it? I ain't wasting a bullet on a rabbit. Give it here. Without waiting for Hank to hand it to him, Henry grabs the rabbit and wrings his neck. There. He's dead. Happy? Henry hands the rabbit back to Hank. Don't tell me you forgot how to skin a rabbit. Henry takes a good-sized bottle out of his pocket and hands it to Hank. Hank takes it and begins to skin the rabbit. So, you're this Billy's maid. Not his maid, Henry. I pull my weight. I do the cooking and grocery shopping. I keep the place clean. We split the expenses. How do you do that if you're not working? I was working. I have some savings. Your mom's money. Yeah. I took that and put it into stocks, but then... Well, that's gone for sure. One minute it was there, the next minute it was gone, like a trap door opened up. God damn. How the hell could you have lost all your mother's money gambling like that? Henry, it's not gambling, it's the stock market. But I told you, didn't I? Couldn't tell you a damn thing. Now, if you put your money in land like I told you, you wouldn't listen to good sense, and now look where you are. Henry, I'm fine. You're broken out of work is what you are. That ain't fine. I'm okay. You thought you was going to make a killing, didn't you? Suddenly, everybody was a banker. That's like saying suddenly you're a farmer. It seems safe. Everybody does it. Sure. Sure. Everybody does it. Now, there's a damn good reason for doing something. <laughs> now, those bankers on Wall Street are so crooked, they screw their socks on in the morning. <laughs> so, we all put our money in mattresses? <laughs> Land... And land. How many goddamn times do I have to say it? If I don't have much except this farm, it's paid for. As long as I got this farm, I got somewhere to live and feed myself. Let them try and take this away. Hell, this farm would kill your average banker in a week. <laughs> don't ever change, Henry. You never should have done it in the first place. You're right. I should have listened to you. They was taking candy from babies. You're right, Henry. Damn, you're something. You know that? I'll be goddamn. You think you don't... You think I don't know what you're doing here? The buzzards are circling. The buzzards are <laughs> Oh, you think... No, no. Now, wait a minute, Henry. I hardly think I could be considered a buzzard. Ah, uh, no. You've been insulted. Jesus ain't that something. You stay away for, what, 10, 12 years? You didn't even come home to Henrietta's funeral. Suddenly, you show up and you're all... You're right, Henry, and I should have listened listen to you, Henry. Your first was mistake was agreeing with me. You never agreed with me in, on anything. Hell, I'd say the sky was blue, you say it was green just to be ordinary. Henry. Don't you, Henry, me. Well, what's going to happen? To what? You know. Say it. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's a sneak. To this farm. When you're gone, when you're dead. What? <laughs> you think I'm going to hand this farm over to you like your mom handed money over to you and then you go out and lose it? Huh? 
My father gave it to me, his father gave it to him. And I worked and sweated my whole life to make this place work. And now you want it so you can lose it too? So who's in line next then? That's my worry, not yours. I think I have a right to know. Don't talk to me about rights. God, you are a son of a bitch, you know that? You're right, Henry, it was a mistake coming here to see you. To see if we could patch things up. We never could talk. Couldn't agree on one thing. I never should have come back here. You came back here because your roots are here. I wasn't born here. Your roots are here, goddammit. Roots don't die. You see those flowers along the fence there? Every fall, I take a mower and mow those flowers down, right down to the ground. Mm -hmm. And the first frost comes, and the snow, and you can't imagine another living thing ever growing there again. Impossible. Every spring, they come back up again. It's because their roots don't die. Oh, yeah, well, that not their roots do for them, and they'll just get mowed down again. Go ask them, Henry. They might say they'd rather be somewhere else. Flowers don't talk. I don't even argue. Who do you know about farming? Who do you know about sea? About storms rising up on the horizon so big you think it's the end of the world coming? And the heat making you wonder if the whole world isn't just going to catch on fire? You left. You wanted to be a writer. Now you want to be a farmer. I want what's mine. What's yours? Something. My name, Henry, I want my name, all right? You got a name. We got the same name, All Henry. right, we got the same name. What of it? Why is that? I don't know. You have to ask your mom, and she's dead. Oh, you don't know why she named me Henry? How should I know? Oh, you're a farmer, all right. You fatten hogs for market, then ship them off to slaughter with a bag and eye. You raise up hay into the sunlight and delight in mowing it down into darkness. You castrate every boar except one, and that used to be you. But it ain't no more, Henry. You spread your seed with the time for harvest has come, Henry. And you know it better than I do. Because you're a farmer. If you stayed here, you might have learned something about how to farm instead of how to talk so damn fancy. Now where's that got you? You're still standing here with your hand out. Oh, aren't you something? If. If hell, if a lot of things, Henry. You don't like sneaks? Well, here's the pure, unadulterated truth. I'm it, Henry. I'm all you've got. And without me, your precious farm will go to hell. Make a bargain with you. I'll stick around, I'll learn the ropes, and we'll play it by ear. Help would be appreciated. It's just like riding a bike, right? What is? Working, putting up hay, once you do it, you never forget. I don't know. <laughs> I never rode a bicycle. <laughs> You know, Henry, despite everything, it did seem simpler when I lived here. In retrospect, happier. I said I like Boston, and I do. But I'd be lying if I didn't say something's missing. You grow up around this, and you miss it. I couldn't imagine living anywhere else. These 288 acres pretty much define my existence. I know every rut, every tree and fence post help. I could plow out there those fields blindfolded. I have a lot of fond memories here. You were sheltered from a lot of things. All children are. Sheltered to hell. Henry, take my word for it. It's a lot simpler here. A lot. Every time times get hard, the first thing people want to do is go back to a time they think was better. When they remember being happier. When things were simpler and easy. The times were never like that because life is never simple or easy. Life ain't happy. What do you think of this place? What do you think of this place? What do you mean? What do you see? Take your time. Reminds me of Mom. There's a real underlying sense of beauty here that reminds me of Mom. That's your family talking, Hank. You're the son I never had. If you want it, show me that you want it. That you really want it. I have the papers drawn up. And this place will be yours when I'm gone. Henry gets up and exits through the house. It's the least you can do, you old fucker. The airport. Billy has picked up Hank. He carries a sign that says, Welcome home, honey, and has given Hank a bouquet of flowers. Here? Why not? It's better than you flying back and forth to take care of him. Bring him here? I'm not sure that's a good idea. He's old. If he gets out of hand, he'll just slap him around. How bad can he be? himself. <laughs> he, he's not this quiet little old man. You can't just slap him around. He'll slap back. 
You come back here every time, physically and mentally beat. You can't keep this up. No, not a good idea. What? We have the best medical care in the world it's here. It's not a good idea. Why not? He doesn't like hospitals. Who does? Or doctors, especially doctors. He's pretty much resigned himself to dying. That's ridiculous. You don't know what you're dealing with. So he's just waiting for the Grim Reaper to tap him on the shoulder and say, Come with me? That's pretty much it. Except he keeps a loaded shotgun by the door. He'll get a few shots out before he goes. <laughs> then I'm going with you the next time to help you. No. Why not? No, Billy, no. Billy, there is Boston, and there is San Francisco, and there are 2,999 miles between here and there. You don't know what you're dealing with. You make it sound like it's some kind of demonic force. <laughs> like it's a force from beyond the grave. It's worse than that. It's my Uncle Henry. <laughs> I get it. Does he know about me? Yes, he knows about you, Billy. You're ashamed of me. That's it, isn't it? Ashamed of you? Now you're being ridiculous. That's why you don't want to bring him here. <laughs> that's why you don't want me to go out there because of us. No, Billy, that's not it. He doesn't even know you're gay, does he? I don't know. I don't. How can he not know? Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> it's never come up and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No. It most certainly does matter, and you know why it matters? Because you're with me, and it matters to me. Billy, I really, I don't need this. Can we just let it drop? This isn't the best time to get all righteous about you and me. It's always the right time, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you're a hypocrite, you know that? You are. How am I a hypocrite? Because you want to know all about the truth about your father, but you don't want to put the truth out there about yourself. Oh, God. It's true, you want people to fess up about themselves, but not you. You're exempt. That's not true. Of course it's not true. That's why I'm coming. Billy! I'm coming next time, and your Uncle Henry will see us together. Period. Billy! End of discussion, I'm coming. I'm not going to French kiss you in front of me. I really wish you wouldn't. French kiss you? No, come! <laughs> I'm coming. Please, Billy. I'm coming. Oh, God. They cross to the farm. It's towards evening. Hank and Billy are coming back from a walk down the road. The lights are on in the farmhouse, lighting the scene with a warm glow. I don't seem to have a signal here. <laughs> Not lately. <laughs> what do I do if I want to make a call? Crank something? I don't think I've <laughs> I don't think I've ever been this far from civilization. This really is the dark side of the moon, isn't it? There's a phone inside. Hank, I saw the phone. It has a dial. <laughs> Henry's not big on technology. I mean, does it actually work? I don't know. I guess <laughs> There's no phone. I said, I guess it works. Why would he have a phone sitting there if it didn't work? Have you ever heard it actually ring? I well, mentioned it. <laughs> Look, he, just, he doesn't get a lot of calls just because I've never seen him use it. This is like fucking time travel. So, <laughs> so what are we supposed to do? About what? About talking. What if there's a fire? What if work is trying to get a hold of me? This wasn't the best time for me to get away. Not my idea. I mean, I can't even text. Where the fuck are we anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Look around. This is where we are. <laughs> <laughs> Lights. Flashing on and off like that. What are those things? Aliens? Am I going to be abducted? <laughs> Am I about to be probed? <laughs> those are lightning bugs. Lightning <laughs> <laughs> bugs. Heard about them. Yeah. <laughs> they look like they could set the woods on fire, don't they? Times Square is amazing. This comes a close second. <laughs> That's good. Times Square. Mm. I need a shower. There's a bathtub. There's no shower. Nope. We take baths. <laughs> baths. You just wallow in your own filth. I hate baths. Unless, of course, unless of course I'm soaking in luxuriant bath oil with heated towels. Mm. No, not here. If we're really dirty, we wash off at the pump. The pump. Yep. Amazing. There's a pump. There's a there's a horse trough too now that we're on the subject. If it's sunny, if it's like a nice warm bath where it's sitting in the sun all day. Please don't make me wash that horse thing. Drought. <laughs> Look, I was raised here. Wasn't perfect, but like, I told you not to come. I wasn't staying home. And I don't want to hear any more snide remarks. Snide remarks? You know what I'm talking about? What? 
Mmm, mmm. Henry, this is the best jello I've ever tasted. We don't have jello like this in Boston, do we, Hank? Well, we don't. I don't even think we have jello, do we? <laughs> what the hell was that, anyway? All mixed up in it. Fruit cocktail. Fancy. I mean it, Billy. <laughs> Fetch me my straw hat and I'll meet you down by at the swimming hole. We'll fry up a mess of old crock daddy for some time. This is done. You left your dip in the kitchen. Uh, want some? Ah, uh, no, thanks, no. You boys have a nice walk? Yes, this is. This is, well. It's not Boston. <laughs> Boy, you look and talk like a Kentucky horse trick. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hank tells me he's your maid. And Hank tells me you're, you're his father. Billy! <laughs> <laughs> Say I know anything about ad agencies. I work on Oral B, on the Oral B account. What's the Oral B? It's a one hundred and fifty dollar toothbrush account that Billy works on. A toothbrush that costs one hundred fifty dollars. That's just throwing away good money. Precisely. <laughs> what did it do? Brush your teeth for you? It's not just a toothbrush. I keep trying to explain this to Hank. It's a complete mouth care system. <laughs> <laughs> advanced cleaning technology that maximizes brushing performance. It effectively removes plaque without irritating the gums. They don't want to come out and just simply say it brushes your teeth. They want to say that it actually brushes your teeth for you, which it doesn't. I mean, you have to hold it in your hand, right? The lawyers are hashing it out. The damn thing brushed your teeth for you. Now that's what I call lazy or tired. So tired you can't even brush your teeth? I've been that tired. I don't think I'd spend $150 on a toothbrush. I'd just skip that night, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's certainly an option. Advertising. I like it. I hate it. An advertising agency doesn't sound like something I'd ever want to be at. Cooking another man's dinner isn't something I'd like to do either. Henry, I told you I'm not his maid. So you're just good friends. We're we're roommates, that's all. Huh? Yeah. Right, Billy? Roommates? Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's what we are. <laughs> <laughs> roommates. <laughs> There's a silence except for the chirping of crickets. A dog barks in the distance. Once, twice, and then a rapid series of barks announcing an intruder. Nice night. Henry sips from his mason jar. Hank contemplatively chews and spits. Billy seeds. So what do you all do out here <clears throat> at night when the lightning bugs have come out? <laughs> this is pretty much it. So Henry, never had any kids of your own? Billy? <laughs> <laughs> Me and Henrietta were never blessed. Did you try? No, what kind of oh, what are you doing? <laughs> Was it you or Henrietta that couldn't? Was she barren or were you shooting blames? Well, you know, that's what we do at night in Boston. We talk about our lives, we're interested in each other's lives, we don't just sit around and chew our cud. Out here, Billy, we mind I, our own business. I thought you were my business. No. No? No, you don't own me. <laughs> oh, my mistake. God, I need a drink. Henry, why don't you give Billy a sip of what you're drinking? <laughs> What's that? This? That, Billy boy, is authentic moonshine. White lightning. Really? That's moonshine from a still? This, this is... Hank throws Henry a wink. Uh, well, I, I don't know. This, um, this is pretty powerful stuff. Go ahead. Billy, taste the taste. Jesus, that's horrible. Yeah, you'll get used to it. God, why would anyone want to? Billy takes another snort. <laughs> Careful, it'll sneak up on you. <laughs> Drink up, Billy. <laughs> I feel like I should blacken out a front tooth and play the banjo. 
Maybe fuck my sister. No, if she ain't good enough for her family. That's not funny. <laughs> Roommates, that's a good one. All right, Billy, that's enough. We're roommates, and Henry and Henrietta weren't blessed, and I'm just sitting here on the porch in Highland Center, Indiana, drinking moonshine and counting lightning bugs. Man, if they could see me now. Henry, you're going to have to excuse my friend. I think he's had a little too much to drink. Henry, did I ever tell you the story of when Hank and I met? Uh, no, Billy, I don't believe you have. Well... Henry, let me tell you. Billy, I don't think Henry is interested in hearing how you and I met. I'd like to hear. See, Hank? Henry wants to hear my story. It's not that interesting. I promise I'll embellish it. <laughs> <laughs> in the right places, of course. Let's hear it. Ah, well, I was a junior account executive at BBD, toiling away on the Gillette account, men's personal care division, very prestigious, very visible. I had my own office. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> on the 39th floor of the Hancock. And if I stood on tiptoe on my desk and grabbed my bookcase and stuck my head out into the hallway and craned my neck uh, all the way around, I could see all the back bay below. That was my office with a view. <laughs> I wanted an office with a real view. I wanted that so bad, and I was willing to work and do whatever it took for me to have it. I was good at my job, very good, still am, and I'm waiting for my break, just being patient, like a tiger waits, you know? And then it came, a series of print ads for a new razor, very big deal, part of TV and POS and blah, 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 nationwide, that was it. Now, I know what you're thinking, Henry. Come on, Billy, a junior AE, given all this responsibility, you're pulling my leg, I know, but see what you see, Henry, don't understand, what you don't understand about ad agencies is they're all smoke and mirrors. You think everyone wants to work at big, bad, BBD, but the truth of the matter is, they work you to the bone. So young people get the experience in their portfolios and get out before they burn out. And the senior people don't do shit except clean up the work of the junior people and take credit for it. So, this is exactly what I've been waiting for so I can land that job at the hip and cool boutique because, well, I'm so hip and cool. Minimum eight print ads, and I'm told a new junior writer was assigned, and I'm thinking, oh shit, this is not good, this is not good, and I look up this junior writer and call him, and he doesn't answer his phone, and I leave a message that he better get his ass up to my office right now, and I hang up, and I go to the senior account guy's office, whose name, Henry, I know won't mean shit to you, but it's a very big deal in this advertising world, a very big deal, and I said, Jack! Jack, I was pleading, what is this, a junior writer? And he says there's nothing he could do. It's the creative department's decision, and I just had to work with it. I go back to my office, and there, sitting there is, well, I wasn't sure what was sitting there. Wherever, whatever it was, it was wearing a blue blazer with gold buttons with anchors on them. Anchors! <laughs> and gray flannel pants, and loafers with tassels, and a tie knotted at the neck. It was our little Hank, <laughs> fresh off the turn-up wagon. Now, Henry, agency copywriters tend to nurture the look that they've slept in their clothes, <laughs> even if they didn't because that's advertising. <laughs> <laughs> it's all image. So now, not only does my big break hinge on a junior writer, it also hinges on a junior writer who doesn't get it. We have four days to pull together our end of the campaign. Basically, that means headlines tomorrow morning, rewrites tomorrow afternoon, comps that night for next morning's meeting, copy fleshed out that afternoon for the next morning's meeting, then finalized for that afternoon to finish start and then to the client. We agree to meet in three hours. Right, Hank? Three, not two. 
I was going easy on you. And do you remember what you brought back to my office, Hank? Do you? Shit. Pure <laughs> shit. Shit about clean shaves and smooth skin and looking like a man. The clock is ticking and what do I decide to do? Remember, Hank, what's my number one rule? When all else fails, go out to lunch. <laughs> I don't want to be seen in the usual places, not with this character. So we grab a cab, go up to Remington's, I know no one will see us there, and Hank seemed almost relieved when we walked in. It's still your kind of place, isn't it, Hank? Best burgers in Boston. <laughs> yeah, best burgers. Anyway, we talk the afternoon away, not about razors or advertising, but everything else. Where we lived and what we wanted to do with our lives, but for all of those hours we spent in that dark bar, not one word about where we came from. Not one. Hmm? I went home that night, and if memory serves, I drank every drop of vodka I had. I still got in the, yard, in the office the first thing, and the red light on my phone was flashing. I didn't recognize his voice. It was hoarse and scratchy. It was like, hey, call me when you get in. I did. And a few minutes later, a figure stood in my doorway holding a single sheet of paper. Hank. Hair and combed, wearing the same clothes he had on the day before, sans jacket, sans tie, his shirt half out, and his pants wrinkled. It's not very good, he said. <laughs> Oh God, I thought. <laughs> he handed me the paper, and it was one single line of copy. Not eight, like we talked about. One. And as we explained his concept, I went from anxious to calm to limp. I wanted to kiss him. <laughs> eight ads, eight different images of men's faces, tough men, construction workers, and firemen, and fishermen, and train engineers. <clears throat> and underneath each one, his one single line, beneath this beard, lies the face of a baby. Hank said that no matter how tough, every man is just like a baby, in need of care and love. It wasn't about razors or personal care. It's about real people, real men. Do you remember what we named it, Hank, the campaign? Yeah. We called it the Baby Face Campaign. The Baby Face Campaign. <laughs> and they didn't take it. They didn't like it. No. But they should have. Never count on the client to do the right thing. And that, <laughs> Henry, is how we became roommates. <laughs> Billy crosses to Hank and lays his hand gently on the side of his face. Then he pulls his hand back and slaps Hank hard. Baby Face. <laughs> Billy exits into the house. I'll put him on a plane tomorrow. Send him back to Boston. Good idea. <laughs> I'll stay on. Summer brought hay season. I would stack the hay bales while Henry drove a tractor. He'd sit atop the tractor, his one arm spinning the wheel and his other arm resting easy on the fender. Following round and round the raked hay into tighter and tighter concentric circles, like Theseus following his string back out of the Minotaur's maze. Only inside, instead of following his string out of the maze, Henry found it deeper and deeper into an open space, sweeping clean with a bailer any sign of our passage along the earth, leaving no trace, no path of which to return as he drove us slowly and methodically and unrelentingly to the exact center of space. It was so quiet there. Out there, two tiny figures lost, marooned, floating in the heat. And it was most quiet at the instant when the last bit of hay was churned up into the baler and Henry would cut the power to the baler, and for an instant, we would float. And I noticed the sound of the wind and the light and the absolute absence of anything around us. Lights down. End of act one. Hank is setting up a string of mole traps in the yard. The trap line follows the meanderings of the mole. 
and in doing so, the yard takes on the appearance of a croquet court made up of medieval torture devices. In two weeks' time, Henry got noticeably worse. And Henry's distrust of outsiders, including neighbors, nurses, or hospice workers, put it all on my shoulders. Running the farm, taking care of him. I knew a thing or two about cancer for mom, but this, this rapid de degradation on Henry's physical being was alarming. This physical decay and rot, the stink. We witnessed the seasonal decline of nature and call it natural and beautiful. But it was just the opposite for me with Henry. I found nothing beautiful about him. And it seemed that just as Henry's natural evolution repulsed me, it seems my attempt to prove to him how much I wanted and deserved my rightful place also seemed to have the opposite effect on him. The porch and yard is not as tidy as it was before. While before there was clutter, at least it was neat clutter. There are numerous yellow egg baskets filled with eggs in need of cleaning. Laundry is flung over a clothesline strung haphazardly on the porch and over the porch railings and chairs. Henry enters from the house. He has gotten noticeably worse. He's sallow and has lost weight. He now carries a small bottle of oxygen. His movements are labored and painful. He shuffles to the porch rail and suddenly vomits over the rail and continues to do so. Hank notices but doesn't respond at first. He finishes setting the trap line before attending to Henry. Henry sits on the rail and Hank starts grabbing the laundry and stuffing it into a wicker clothes basket. You're not doing too good today, are you? No, I'm not. The doctor said you'd have good days and bad ones. Oh, uh, well, he got that right at least. Jeez, I can't breathe. Those traps might catch Pete. Easier just to shoot the damn thing. That's the way I kill wolves. Each his own, I guess. That's right. I don't have to sit on the porch and wait for him. I let my traps do the work. These eggs need cleaning. Yeah, they do. They need cleaning by tomorrow. Harold comes for them for tomorrow. That's tomorrow's problem. I've got it covered. Oh. You got a couple. I'm gonna run out and check on that sow and her litter. She rolled over on another one yesterday, now there's just five. Shit. Yeah. Ache all over. <laughs> Feel like that sow rolled over me. I'm thinking of grabbing them all and bottle feeding them. What? The piglets? What for? So she won't kill anymore. That'll kill them faster than if she rolls over them. Just let Nature do her work. I can take care of them. What are you gonna do? Sit up nights bottle feeding pigs? I'm already sitting up all night with you. She can take care of them fine. You always lose some. Henry, we got a nice healthy litter there. There's a boar you can mate with the rest of the litter. Those sows and give you more litters. You gotta take care of them. You're telling me how to raise hogs now, huh? I'm just saying, shit, Henry, you know I'm right. I never breastfed a pig in my life. I am not <laughs> breastfeeding them for God's sake. I'm just going to hand feed them with a bottle and a nipple. Jesus! Do you want a milkshake before I go? You gonna give it to me in a baby bottle? Uh, <laughs> So get it up your ass if you don't watch it. <laughs> Do you want one? What's in you? So I'll just throw it up again. You gotta put something in you. You have to eat. I'll just throw it up again. You've got to eat. Otherwise, those doctors will come and stick a tube in you and feed you that way. I don't want one. All right. One of those Grover boys will be over sometime this morning. He's gonna clean and box these eggs for me. What the hell? What? Hell no! You ain't bringing no goddamn Grovers over here to clean eggs. You ain't bringing no one on my property to do my work now. You, yeah, Henry, what? I hired out a couple of kids to take care of the chickens in the garden. When the hell did you do that? The other day, I was going past their place and they were out in the yard, so I stopped and asked them if they wanted to make some money. They're just kids. You went behind my back and hired a bunch of growers to come over to my place. They're just doing some light chores. If you can't do your work, just say so, but you don't go around telling people. And don't go bringing no groovers around here. Don't be bringing nobody onto my property. Henry, it's a business. This farm is a business. Business. Business! Where the hell do you come up with this stuff? Bottle feeding pigs and business! This is a family farm! Henry, I'm doing this for the family. I'm hiring people, kids, paying them a couple of bucks to get some of the shit work out of the way. Why should I clean eggs when my time can be better spent overseeing things? Oh, you're too good to clean eggs, huh? You can scrub an egg and oversee at the same time. What are you, helpless? You got your traps working for you here? You got the goddamn Grovers helping you there? Pretty soon you'll have this farm run itself, and it'd be like a goddamn country fair around here. You wanted me to prove I want this farm, and that's what I'm doing. Oh, that's what you're doing. This farm's been here for over a hundred years with nothing but family running it, but that's not good enough for you. Hell no, you gotta stir up the pot. What did you think? I'm trying to intentionally ruin everything for you? Maybe it's time to look at things a little differently. 
My ideas can carry the family into the future instead of stagnating in the past. Stagnating? What are you talking about? You know, stagnating. Things just festering, not getting better. I'm talking about hogs and soybeans. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I can move this family into the future. The hell do I care about the future? Oh, right. Sorry, wasn't thinking. You think you can just waltz in here and take over? Over my dead body, you will, and I mean that. Bringing strangers around. I ain't dead yet. Not by a long shot. Now, are you going to clean them eggs, or what do I have to? The lighting should suggest the lighting should suggest coolness and <clears throat> dappled sunlight. A low hill with a few trees and mowed grass and emptiness, and the absence of everything around him. We didn't have much in the house to eat, so I hopped in the Chevy and drove the hard eight miles to St. Peter's. Brookville would have been easier, so longer, but the roads are better, and there's the A&P that would have had a lot more. But St. Pete's got the most of what you need. A little little store, park filling station, the church, and the graveyard. I got a pound of ham, the real kind, not the boiled kind, a loaf of sunbeam bread, and some yellow mustard, a couple cartons of milk. Then I wandered over to Mom's grave. Alice Ann is sitting on her gravestone. The tableau has the feel of Botticelli's Birth of Venus. A slight breeze rustles her hair and dress. There she was. Just her name, date of birth, and date of death. No loving wife of, no loving mother of, no caring sister of. Henry picked it out. Figures. I would have written something special. Look at you. Look at you. What'd you do, steal your Uncle Henry's truck? I always said if I was one of the apostles, I'd have stolen the keys of the donkey. <laughs> Look at you. How's farm life treating you? How's Henry? Look at my hands. Oh my god, what's happened to them? Yeah, they're just blistered, that's all. Henry's not looking <coughs> up on me. <clears throat> Hard work never killed anybody! Covered in blisters? Didn't he give you any gloves to wear? It's all right, really, it is. You should wear gloves. You need a haircut. Look at your clothes, they're filthy. You shouldn't have sent me out here with good clothes, then. <laughs> oh, a city boy. They never understood why a nine-year-old boy didn't have work clothes. I still tell people we were too poor to send me to summer camp, so you sent me out here to work. We weren't poor, and you liked it. Yeah, you did. And I'd always get the runs from the well water. Henry likes seeing you. I'm no good at this, Mom. I'm not. None of this. I don't know how to run a farm. I don't know how to take care of Henry. Every morning I get up and I'm so damn tired. Henry doesn't sleep in the barn and I can hear him all the way in the house puking all over himself. That's how loud he is. The fields, the garden, everything is going to hell. Just make him comfortable, Henry. Hopefully it won't be much longer. I hope not. At least then you can worry about the garden and the pigs. He makes me sick. He smells. I don't want to touch him, but I have to. It's going to get worse, Hank. I know. I know. God, he's an animal. Hank. I can't stand to touch him or to look at him, so I just pretend he's livestock, a sick pig or a cow, and that's how I do it. <clears throat> but I don't know how long that's going to work. Dying's not pretty, Hank. I'm going back to Boston. <clears throat> Somebody else can take over. I've done my bit. Hank, you can't. You're the only one. If you go, he won't have anyone, and he really will be an animal then. He'll die just like some animal that dragged itself into the woods to die. He's... Tanks. The doctors have to feed him chocolate milkshakes to keep his strength up, but he no more finishes one than he throws it back up again. He's rotting from the inside out. He has cancer, Hank. It's in his bones. Once he starts shitting his pants. He has cancer, Hank. How can you be like that? Like what, Hank? Nobody took care of you. You died alone. I don't remember Henry being around for you, and you and him were. Brother and sister. We were brother and sister, Hank. He could have come and taken care of me. I had a husband. Yeah, and what, where the hell was he? JP. We all do the best we can, Hank. JP did the best he could. He kept his promise. Hank, he loved me right up to the end. And my goodness, how that man could love me. Um. Oh, Hank, it's true. Stop it. I never met anyone like him. I knew he was different from other men the minute I laid eyes on him, and he loved me, I know that. And I used that knowledge to my advantage. I asked more out of JP than any woman would have dared to ask out of any other man, and he didn't always like it, but he stuck with it. He kept his promise. You died alone, Mom. I found you dead in the hallway. You were crawling to the bathroom, and you died there on the floor, remember? I do. Your nightgown was pulled up and you died on the floor with your eyes open and your mouth open and that's how I found you. I wasn't alone. Right. You were so little. You're such a little man. 
Are you scared like you were then? No. No, I'm not scared when I'm with you. You? Not when I'm with you. I never understood why misery loves company. Hey, why do people sit? Well, I suffered, so you have to suffer too. I walked two miles in the snow, so you should too. Shouldn't it be if you suffered, you don't want anyone else to go through what you went through? Shouldn't it be that we should want to stop suffering in the world, not preserve it? Hank, take care of Henry. Do your best, but don't quit. Don't run out on him. Hank, we all end up the same place. The only difference is how we get there. <clears throat> Pine box, Hank. We all end up there. So, make Henry's last weeks on Earth as pleasant as possible, but he's still going to end up there? I wasn't talking about Henry. I was talking about you, Hank. Shit. What is it? Henry's leaving me his farm. He showed me the papers. That land's been in the family for three generations. You'd make the force. What am I going to do with it? I don't know anything about farming. Henry hates all my ideas. He won't let me hire anyone. I'll ruin the place. I'll starve and be made a laughing stock all at the same time. You always were a worrier. What do you care what anybody thinks if there's weeds in the garden and hogs rooting in the field? What do you care? Huh? And Henry always did like to keep things in the family. Take care of him, Hank. All you have to do is take care of him, and before you know it, it will be all over and that farm will be yours. What's the matter? Nothing. Hank picks up the groceries. This was supposed to be Henry in my supper. I should have left him home alone. Alice Ann watches Hank leave. JP enters and passes Hank, who notices something in the breeze. Don't worry, Scooter. Bye. Hank jumps into the pickup. We hear the door slam, the engine start, and the truck drive away. You always were too easy on him. Now don't start, JP. Calling <laughs> him like that. He's still such a baby. I'm talking about Henry. If Hank wants that farm so bad, he should haul the old fucker into court, carve a hunk of DNA out of his backside, and prove once and for all the one thing we would all suspect. And what's that, JP? I'll show the bitches I can do arithmetic. I can add, and I can count up to nine. JP, we've been over this. Babies are born prematurely all the time, boys, all over the world. Boys got a right to know. No, what? For land's sake, there's nothing to know. Isn't there? No! I've told you a hundred times, and you just keep insisting on something different. You put that idea in his head, and that poor boy has just suffered. You knew he was home that day. You said it yourself. Come peeking over the windowsill. You stood under his window, and you just planted seeds. That's what you did. Seeds of dissent. Let them die, JP. Let them die. Just a question. That's all I... JP, he's your son. I've told you that. Why don't you ever believe me? I already love you, and now you want me to believe you, too. <laughs> you are <laughs> so <laughs> exasperating sometimes. You know that. That's what makes me so damn charming. That's what makes <laughs> me such a damn idiot is what it does. <laughs> I, I have no idea why that boy wants all that dirt, but I wish I had the money. I'd buy that farm for him so he could just go home. You would do that for him, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, of course, that's easy for me to say, not having the money. I'm afraid he wants more than just the farm. Maybe he's got more of his daddy in him than you thought. Well, he always was bullheaded. I figured he got it from your side of the family, though. He's not sweet like me. No, he isn't. <laughs> Maybe I should do what you did. Just sit him down, give him some fatherly advice, like I used to. You never did that in your life. <laughs> well, maybe I could start. You know, it's just never too late. John Philip, don't you go start in trouble. I mean it. Let sleeping dogs lie. Let Henry die in peace and let Hank get his farm. That's all we got to do, right? Don't rile Henry. Just wait for Henry to die and we all go back to minding our own business. Yes, that's exactly right. You want him to have that farm now, too, don't you? Only one thing wrong with that, Sugar Bridges. What's that? Boys got a right to know. We all got a right to know. Lights shift. JP thumbs arrive. It's night. Hank is driving home on a rough back road in the pickup. The truck bucks and rattles. It's a pitch black, moonless night with nothing illuminating the scene except the dashboard lights and the headlights reflecting off trees and road. 
Sitting next to Hank on the pickup's front bench is JP, who is loose, drunk, and in high spirits. He's got his foot up on the dash, his right elbow out the window, and he's drinking from a pint bottle of Seagram's. They ride in silence for a while, then... Did nobody ever tell you to pick up Hitchhiker's Hanky? It's dangerous! <laughs> dangerous! Out on the road, late one night, I see my pretty Alice in every headlight. Alice, down and down, 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 Dallas, Alice. Driven the back road so I wouldn't get late. Whoa! Hey, slow down, speed racer. Don't want to end up wrapped around no trees. This would be a terrible place to die, wouldn't it? It's Wade. What? Whoa, what did you say? What do you know? As I live and breathe, he speaks. Wade, the lyric to the song. Driven the back road so I wouldn't get Wade. Not Wade. <laughs> what the fuck does Wade mean? Why the fuck wouldn't you want to get laid? <laughs> He's driving a truck. He's driving a truck and they weigh trucks on the interstate, so he stays off the interstate and drives on the back roads to avoid way station. Oh, way station! Ah, oh, oh, got it. Is that what that song's about? It's what that line means. Oh. <laughs> you fucking little smartass. <laughs> so, what you gonna do, fucking smarty pants? You, uh... Are you running, or are you going to take care of that sorry sack of shit? I know what you do. <sighs> oh, hell yes, I know what I do. Uh, I bury that fucker in the backyard up to his neck, then run the lawnmower over him. <laughs> Can you imagine that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right over that big fucking head of his. <laughs> but now uh, he ain't leaving me no farm. It's a little, little different, huh? <laughs> Now, your circumstances, huh? Mine, huh? Of course not. <laughs> Maybe he ain't leaving you no farm either. It wouldn't be the first time that some of a bitch lied for his own gain. What would he have to gain? Ugh, somebody to wipe his ass for him. Henry isn't like that. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Rather wallow in his own shit than actually reach out to somebody, so you're going to hold your nose so in the end you can be the proud owner of 300 acres of prime bottom. I'm not a gold digger. I'm not gonna clean up his shit just like I'm a farm in the end. Oh, well, no, hell no, you got principles. Yeah, you'll put on an apron and clean a house and let some guy dick you up the ass, but no siree, you ain't gonna clean up no shit! <laughs> Fuck no, you got your standards. Well, let me tell you something, you little cocksucker. You <laughs> don't know shit about <laughs> principles. There might be other reasons why I don't want the farm, but that's got nothing to do with it. That's beside the point. You think about taking care of your family, Something you know nothing about. Don't you fucking judge me. Don't you dare fucking judge me. You don't know me enough to judge me. Oh, well, isn't that ironic, JP, considering you're my father? Oh, shit! What's the matter? Did, didn't your daddy hug you enough? God damn, you are a fucking prize. You know that? A fucking prize. You're a country boy in the city and a gay boy in the country. You don't know up from down. You don't know shit from Shinola, do you? Well, considering the role model I had... Fucking role model? <laughs> I ain't no role model. Yeah, well, that's obvious. No, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> you think you're the first person on this planet that didn't know what was going on? What, you looking for answers? All right, I'll tell you. You want answers? I'll give you answers. There ain't no fucking answers! There you go, there's your answer. <laughs> Why can't you for one fucking minute of your life pretend that you're a mature, intelligent human being that's leading a useful life? Oh boy, you are one desperate, sorry-ass son of a bitch. I see my pretty Alice in every headlight. Alice! What's the purest, most beautiful thing you can think of? I'm what do you want to think? I don't know. What's yours? Yeah, I asked you first. Well, I ask you say. Uh, Jesus Christ, just answer the fucking question! What do you think about when you think about something nice? I don't know, I guess I always think back when I'd be in my bed just before I'd fall asleep. It's like we were real family then, like you'd see on TV. Oh, yeah, yeah, remember that? 
Yeah, you have the puppets up in the air. Marionettes. Yeah, all dangling there from the ceiling. Yeah, there's, there's strings that get all knotted sometimes, and, and you'd make me untangle them. <laughs> and you had that, um, what, that little uh, rat in the cage. Hamster. <clears throat> it was a hamster, not a rat. <laughs> His name was Mr. Chubbs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. You named him that. <laughs> Boy, you were a funny little kid. All right, well, now, you know, now there's where you go. There's your home. When things get all tangled and, and you get so tired, your, your breathing gets labored, and your, your thoughts do that sickening thing they can do, you know, going too fast and too slow at the same time. It's, it's hard to explain, but you know, that's what they do. And that's where you go. You just, you just put that in your head. That's not a home. It's a nice thought, but it's not a home. A house with a family in it. Well, let me tell you something. You're out in this world alone. They need some comfort, you, you have to find it wherever you can. And if you can, keep it inside you. So you can, you can pull it up whenever you need it. That's good. I mean, I don't know, it ain't no house, I know that, but... No, if it makes you feel like a house would, well, what the hell's the difference? Hmm, you tell me that. So what's yours? Pull over. Pull over. I said pull over, goddammit! Hank stops the truck abruptly. The tires skid on loose gravel. JP gets out. The hot truck engine ticks as it cools in the night air. JP slams the truck shut and it makes an empty metal sound as hollow as a drum. There are night sounds. JP leans in the window. Your mom. Mm -hmm. Prettiest thing I ever saw. First time I ever laid eyes on her, she was wearing this, this old barn coat. I turned around fast because I didn't want her seeing me with my, my jaw hitting the floor, and, and I'll tell you this. When I looked into her eyes, it's like I knew her my whole life. And then not just this lifetime, but all eternity. And she needed me. I, I could see that she... See that just looking in her eyes. She needed me, and, and it scared her to death. She needed me to teach her what love is and how a man and a woman can be when they lay down together. She needed me for that, and I'm afraid she flunked that lesson, but she flunked it good. But I, I needed her too. I, I, I used her just like she used me. When we lay down together and I turn over and see her face in the light, it was like I was a child again. And, and not just any child, the child that, that crazy, scared, confused, happy, hopeful little shit of a kid we all were at one time, when the heat coming off our heads could breathe life back into a dead man. But I will never allow myself to be that child again. I won't beg, and I will never let someone see me like that again. JP and Hank continue looking at each other. JP then chucks the bottle on the seat of the truck and disappears into the night. Hank watches him, following him with his eyes, and continues to stare where JP disappears. Hank picks up the bottle, considers it, opens it, and takes a pull. He puts the truck in gear and spins out on the gravel road. <clears throat> he floors it. I've been warped by the rain, driven by the snow, drunk and dirty, but don't you know I'm still dead. Light breaks on early morning at the house. <clears throat> Hank comes skidding into the yard in the truck. He gets out. Henry enters from the house. Where you been? Worried about me? I need the truck. You can barely stand up. What do you need the truck for? Hank starts ripping the mole traps out of the ground, throwing them to the side. I'm going to Brooksville. Hmm, what are you going to do there? I don't ask you what you're doing, do I? Yeah, you do all the time. What do you want? I'll get it for you. Thought you were babysitting pigs. I'm babysitting you too, wiping your ass. You're just another piece of livestock to me. Now, what do you want in Brookville? Get up on the mole traps, huh? Yeah, it's just better to blow them out of the ground. You were right. Now you're talking sense. I'm keeping the pigs up here, though. They're doing good away from their mother. It's your business. Yeah, it is. Now, what do you want in Brookville? I want to settle up at the Agway. There's nothing to settle up or settle up. That's for me to judge. What's the matter, Henry? Don't you believe me? Jesus, I don't have to get your permission. Ah, no, but you take care of to drive. my own business and want to see my lawyer, all right? You, you know, you could have just come out and said it. I'm just crossing my T's and dotting my I's. God damn it, he said you'd lie. 
<laughs> he said you'd lie to help yourself, but I never would have believed that one. Who said that? You showed me the papers, Henry. You tell me now. Who said I was lying? You showed me your will, you son of a bitch. You ran Billy off and strung me along just so you'd have someone to wipe your ass, you self-centered old goat. Who said I was lying? Sit down! Sit down before I knock you down! Hank pushes him to a chair. Mm. You're looking worse than a dog. If you were livestock, I'd have put you out of your misery a long time ago. I'll clean you up, then I'll take you to your lawyer. Makes no difference to me. Hank gets a wash basin and rifles through Henry's pockets for his barlow. Hank ties a towel around Henry's neck and leans him back. Hank lathers Henry's face and sharpens the knife on a straw. He then begins to shave Henry's face. I guess all this wasn't such a good idea, was it? Me being a farmer? It's not for everybody. Still, you didn't give me much of a chance, Henry. Why does it feel like you had me set up all along? I knew you couldn't run this farm. I knew it from the start. So why'd you let me try? It wasn't my idea, it was yours. I didn't ask you to show up the day you did when you did. I was just sitting here on the porch minding my own business and you showed up. What'd you come for? That's the hundred dollar question. Weren't you glad to see me? I'm not sure this is a conversation I should be having with a knife at my throat. Oh, what's the matter, Henry? Don't you trust me? Is there a reason this knife oughtn't to slip, aside from you throwing me to the side so you can cash in your chips? Why don't you just put that thing down? Oh, no, don't worry, Henry. I trusted no, now you're just going to have to trust me. I'm not going to cut your throat. This is just like skinning a rabbit. And I'm not going to desert you, i got nowhere to go. You're all I've got now, Henry. Just you and me now. I'll take care of you. To wipe your ass if I have to, feed the priest some nice things to say about you since he won't know you from Jesus Christ himself. Make sure you get a decent burial there next to Henrietta. I want to be buried next to Alice Ann. There's, there's a plot next to her. I bought and paid for it myself. Mm, yeah, well, there's a plot next to your wife, too, and that's where you're going. JP can have the one next to Mom, or mm. I'll just plant the two. God damn it! God damn, God damn JP! JP is not going next to Al and Alice Ann over my goddamn dead body. God, Henry, you are the master of irony, do you know that? It is over your dead body, and your dead body won't have a whole lot to say about it. He's her husband, Henry. Henrietta's your wife. That's the way things go. I'll get my lawyer, I'll have him dig my body back up. I'm going next to her. Henry, I half think you actually believe you can do that. I am sick to death of the lunacy in this family, and it's going to stop, and it's going to stop with me. Get it straight. Who's your wife? Who's your sister? And while we're on the subject, who's your son? You talk about a hundred dollar question, we never could get this straight. You don't know what you're talking about. What the hell do you know? You were just a kid. You're still just a kid. What's going on here, Hank? Henry? Yes, I was just a kid. That's my point. I, I don't know what you're talking about. The hell you don't. You can't lay claim to mom, your sister, and not me. What your mother and I had between us, you and I will never have. I uh, slit your throat right now. What me and Alice Ann had was something way beyond brother and sister. You can't understand that. You're in no position to. We were practically twins. We were 15 months apart to the day we were two peas in a pod. That's right. We were two peas in a pod. And then you come along. You. You run her off. You're the reason she left and married that damn JP. You. That's right. I left because I was pregnant with Hank. I came along. That's right. Henry, now we're getting somewhere. Where did I come from, Henry? Did I just drop out of the sky? Did you find me in a manger in the barn? Was it one of the Grovers? Get her out of the woods? You know damn well where you come from. No. I don't. Was it JP, huh? Henry was a JP. Mom always said, I took after him. No. It wasn't JP. JP came later. That's right. I needed a father for my baby, so JP came later. Well, then who was it? Who's left? There's the mystery. Who else could have had Alice Sand? It's hard for me to think of her with anyone but JP. What about you, Henry? Is it hard for you to think with her, with another man? It is so goddamn hard, isn't it, Henry? Yes, it is. Then why don't you just get it off your chest, then? It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. Make you feel better. It was me. What? You, it was you. Henry, then say it. Say it, Henry. Say it was you. 
It was me, it was me. She was mine. It was you what, Henry? It was you that what? We did it everywhere. Out in the locust patch by the creek. Up in the barn. Night in the bed. There was only one bed for us kids, and we just crawled in there like puppies. We did, Hank. It wasn't wrong. We were just like puppies. Alice and me were just like two peas in a pod. Then what am I, Henry? What am I? You know what I am, Henry. Say it. You're a bastard. You're a bastard, and you should have been put in a slot for the pigs. Yeah, that's right. That's what I am. I'm a bastard. I told that's her exactly what I am. I told her to just throw it away. Then everything would be fine again. Just wait. She wouldn't do it. Son, you want to hear me call you that, but you won't. Because it ain't true. You're the son I never had. I never had a son. Henry. Stay out of this. Now you listen to me. Are you listening to me, Henry? Because I'm going to tell you something. You listen good. She loved him. Him, JP, not you. All you had to do was open your eyes. You could see it. You know it's true. That's why you hate him so much, isn't it? She picked him, not you. He's a drunkard! And she loved me, too. She left because she loved me, not you. She handpicked JP for me. That's family. Henry, that's family. Henry sits slumped back in his chair. Hank picks up the shotgun. He pauses and looks at Henry, gauging him, measuring him. He touches the barrel to Henry's throat. Henry is having a hard time breathing. Then Hank descends the stairs and goes around the back of the house. The ringing of cicadas is low, but slowly rises until the sound is extra loud. Alisan descends the porch. We hear a shotgun fire and pigs squealing. The cicadas abruptly stop singing. Stone cold silence. And then the shotgun fires four more measured times. Between each gunshot, there's the sound of Hank locking and loading the shotgun. And every time Hank takes careful aim and fires, there's one less piglet squealing. The last piglet squeal is particularly loud and shrill and frightened. At the same time, Alice Ann lifts the towel from around Henry's neck. Then she carefully places the towel over his face, then pulls it down hard. Henry struggles, and she pulls harder until the last piglet dies. The lights ease down to late afternoon. There's a black ribbon tied around each one of the porch's posts. The light is softening to a pinkish hue. There is a, rel a relief to the day. As the air cools, there's even a breeze, and life responds with contentment. Birds twitter in the nearby bushes. Bees make one last run for, for nectar before heading back to the hive. Hank and Billy emerge from the house. Hank is dressed in suit pants and a dress shirt. No tie. He's barefoot. Alice Ann is off to the side, watching. It's time. I should be getting back. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Yeah. Sure you can't stay for supper? I can fry up some pork chops. There's plenty of beer left in the trunk. We can make a night out of it. No, I really... I have to return my rental. My flight gets in at midnight. He'll be waiting up? Yeah. Sorry it all came down on one day. No. I didn't want you to find out some other way. I didn't want to have to write a Dear Hank letter. I appreciate it. He's good, huh? Well, I'm still eating takeout. <laughs> he works late, comes home from the office, and after a stint of rubbing my tootsies, he works on his spreadsheets while I read People magazine. <laughs> I didn't think he would be my type, but then I doubt he'll run off to the heart of darkness in search of himself either. Well, and he insists on paying half the mortgage. You have to love these modern men. <laughs> no. There you go. It was good seeing you. I'm sorry for everything. Yeah, me too. Take care of yourself, Scrimshaw. Roommate. You too. I love you, Scrimshaw. But I'll never understand you in a hundred years. Drive safe. Bye. Billy starts to hug Hank, but stops. 
Billy exits. Hank stands down by the road. We hear a car door slam, an engine start, and the beep beep of a small car's horn. The car drives off. Hank stands with his hand up, frozen in a wave of goodbye. Look at you. Look at you. Sorry about your bow. Yeah, sorry for everything. Yeah, well. You've done good, Hank. I'm proud of you. JP, your daddy. He'd be proud of you too if he was here. So what are you gonna do now? Well, for starters, I guess I have to buy some hogs. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> the Grover stopped by. So the old man, he's not a bad sort. They're gonna give me a hand, thought I'd rent the lower south field to him. He gave up a lot. Yep. Fourth generation. Yeah. I'm fourth generation. Hank, about Henry and me. No. Now listen, Hank, you listen to me. We were just kids. I tried to warn you, but you wouldn't listen. Some people just move away and start over and forget about everything. Other people, you, for instance, dig into their own past, like digging in the ground there. Roots. And there's no changing it. The past, and it's hardly ever pretty, what you find, we're just not like that. None of us are. We want to be flowers, but most of us, most of us are just weeds. You gonna be all right? Yeah. You scared? Not if I'm with you. You're all alone now, Hank. You know that, don't you? I guess I do. Yeah. I'll visit you every Sunday. I'll put flowers on your grave on your anniversary. That'd be nice. You remember what I like? Yeah. Yeah? What are they? Pineys. <laughs> you remember it. <laughs> and in the end, there's a place for you there, too. Next to me. Alice Ann disengages herself from Hank. She gives a little wave before exiting. Hank crosses to the porch and sits in Henry's chair. He is alone. He brings forth a beat, uh, he brings forth a beat-up notebook, a pencil stub, and begins to scribble in his journal. The land held secrets to be uncovered, hidden by space and the dense green living fog of undergrowth that caused the woods to simply fade away. Farther and farther I wander the countryside, across furrows and corn stubble in and out among the sparkling trees and patches of sunlight, picking my way around fallen logs ripe with lichens and beetles, slippery centipedes and woodworms, to the far corners of the woods and the far outreaches of the fields. I lay in the cool, green, luminous grass that grew thick in the damp foam and felt the earth slowly and purposely reclaim me, as deftly and patiently as a milk snake swallows an egg. Lights fade to black, and the play.
it's definitely a first round. Uh, hopefully it's a last. It's, I mean, I went on the first day, and it was fine, but because they did have a performance, it was very well, so it was like we were hoping to get it. But last night, I had to keep it in. I had to keep it in. I had to keep it in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I was planning on taking a great So that's a good one. Yeah, three days. Uh, when she did a doubt, 
that yeah. is a separate system. Oh. But she just oh. has it. Yes. I mean, I'll just go to New York. Right, so this is the one, one of the uh, first stop after she did that. I mean, I just, well, my own, I think she can see plates for me. But that's what the first time I found her. Um, and she, I, I think she's good. Sit down. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna have to just watch it. Yeah. 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 Ye
jelly beans. Yeah, right? Jelly beans for everyone. Yeah. Except you don't eat jelly beans. I have beans. Setting the scene was really great, so you got a feel for the place. I think that's really important, the place and the feel, and where um, what Hank had left and come back to. And, I, and for me, I just felt like, okay, I'm in the world. Thank and you. I, as an audience member, that's really important to me. I liked the moments where things felt like they were just about to explode. Like, just simmering under the surface. Um, for example, with um, Billy. You know, the scene with Billy where it's like, it's, the, it's testing the water, is it going to get there? Um, those types of moments. The moments with JP, too, um, in the car. You know, those types of, like, it's so tense, you can, you can feel it, but you know that the reason why it's so tense is because it's not exploding, you know? It's because it's it's staying there, and you're like, you just want them to say something. Just get it out, just say it, you know? And those are the really compelling moments. Thank you. Um, what popped for me initially was, um, I love dead people on stage, so, uh, so <laughs> being like, oh, 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 and realizing that the mother is uh, not necessarily of this time, that she is sort of ethereal and can do more than most others. Uh, that was that was interesting. That that always excites me. <laughs> Great, and I saw some head nods with that. So more than one people person thought that. Yes, Mom. I thought the confrontation with uh, Billy and Henry and Hank that was the most. We were laughing a lot. That felt really a lot. And, and I agree the scene with the JP in the car is, is very surprising. It's very Thank you. Yes, I just really loved the loving relationship between Hank and Alice. Mm -hmm. That was very obvious. It was a little to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, I particularly, in, well, besides the fact that I, you know, I mentioned John during the intermission, during our little intermission, how much I enjoyed the sense of place. Um, I like the way laughs were drawn from these very, very tense and uncomfortable moments that, you know, if any of us had to experience firsthand, these would be incredibly unpleasant moments, but the fact that you could, at the same time, while bringing the you know the, the dramatic uh, stakes were very high, there was always the you know, continue this humor, this humorous level on it. You know, that you can get as an audience member. Agreed. Thank you. I have to say, as as a person and as a gay man living already for twenty one years here in the in the states, actually, I felt like another reason why I probably don't want to go back home. And, and face some of the, re I don't know if reality, but it's things that I don't really, 
well, yeah, realities that I don't want to face because I don't. I'm so different now to what they think and what they and how they live and all of that that I could stand it. So when I I heard and I saw the story, I thought, oh my God, this is another reason. Like definitely, I don't want to go back there. There's no reason for me to go back there at all. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Uh, another, another thing that kind of popped for me was uh, Billy's monologue of how they met. Uh, I thought it was a really smart and fun way of almost having something totally blow up, so it kept us really interested and really on our seats, but then also giving us this wonderful, beautiful backstory, both into how they met and it also really revealed. I think it's quite easy to let a character like Billy kind of slip through the cracks and just sort of be a thing that we use on stage to tell more story about the main character, but you get this wonderful insight into him, and it was just this sort of little tangent that was just, I thought, really beautiful, and then also sort of the purpose of the play. And then we watch him make that decision not to say the whole thing. Right? That was delicious. <laughs> Thanks for that, John. <laughs> All right, were there any parts for you as audience members where you dropped out, where you started thinking about your grocery list, or looking at your watch? Definitely is. Um, the, at the end of the first act, where he goes back to his journal and writes, it's like, uh, the end of the scene is, I'll tell him to go back to Boston tomorrow, good idea, and then he writes something in his journal, and that was, that I just completely felt like I, I didn't need it. I just wanted to end the scene. Okay. And, and I gotta say, I feel a little bit like this with the monologue at the very end of the play as well. So I just could have done with way less of this RC version of the show. Okay. It's funny because that's the part I love because it's poetic and there's the, um, so much layering because there's the you know the land and there's a lot of darkness but there's also a lot of beauty and the um, journaling also brings forth that like poetic Form. I agree with all of that, but I think you could be done in about half to a third mm -hmm. of the time that it's taking right now. Any other thoughts? I found, I found myself to be a little confused in the scene, uh, the confrontation scene where Henry divulges, when Hank starts to be really abusive to him before he divulges. I just wasn't sure psychologically. I, I felt like I missed a step or something. Like exactly where? I mean, he he starts to be, you know, get really angry at him and say, you know, I could just kill you now, whatever. And I felt like, whoa, what happened? You know, I, yeah, I, 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 actually, I couldn't follow psychologically his transformation. I felt the same way actually, like it, it seemed like it just happened so fast, but then I was thinking, well, when you're taking care of someone who's sick for such a long time and you're questioning like what you are and what you're doing and why are you taking care of this person that you don't necessarily really love, so maybe that would be the reason why like all of a sudden you just snap and say, you know, I just want this person to die. I don't know, but I felt the same way too, like why so suddenly? Unless that was the reason why that he just had had it. I, I actually I, I lost some sympathy. I don't know if you wanted this to happen, but I, I my rapport with uh, Hank was severed at that point in a way that it never quite actually came back. Thank you, Rich. Would you something to add? Yeah, um, I saw his his anger and his break from the car ride with JP. I thought that that's what set him mm. off. Um, so maybe if instead of messing, like, I, I mean, I liked the way that the scene ended with him humming the same tune, but if maybe some sort of anger, he can see some sort of anger building inside of him from that conversation so that you can tell, like, he's been driving all night, he's been swinging, um, the James and their, whatever, he's swinging. Seagram. Seagram. This is Seagram. This is James. 
thank you for, for clarifying. Um, the Seagrams, uh, and if, I'm not sure if that's what you saw as the catalyst. That's, I mean, that's what I saw it as. But if you wanted some sort of build and like that, you can like see the theory kind of coming in him, and he's taking it out on Henry. Um, I, I thought what might be happening is that he's afraid he's going to go change his will, and that gets him really angry. But then he doesn't even know if he really cares about the farm. So why is that? Why would that make that vicious? You know, why would making that change? Anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, Ian, and then Grant. I, I mean, I, I kind of saw the same thing. I think Rachel saw because you know he's been driving all night after having this very difficult conversation with his absentee, at least on paper, father, uh, and drinking, you know, sleep deprivation, some alcohol, emotionally tense conversation with things said and unsaid. I mean, that, that can make someone a little bit on the paranoid side. Uh, and and, and uh, you know, their behavior is going to be a bit off. And I think that that I thought that was pretty apparent. You know, all the the setup was given. Right, you know, we saw the setup in this preceding scene. I thank you. I, I'd have to agree with that. I saw the setup, but I also wonder what specific seeds JP planted that are festering that make him take that extra dime. Did anybody else have something to say about that thing specific grant? I think I do. <laughs> um, uh, sort of yes to whatever uh, what everyone is saying, but I guess I got lost kind of retroactively, where I did buy the arc of what he was doing, but then I was like, wait, let me backtrack. He didn't seem that impassioned about an identity or not knowing who or what he was in the beginning. And so the only reason that I was taking out of that little circle, that little arc, was because I'm like, well, he doesn't, what was so bad about his life before? You know, that part, that part wasn't clear. It wasn't so much what was actually happening on stage. It was, I was echoing back to the beginning and I was like, wait, I can't remember the problem that got him here. I can't remember the inciting incident that was so big that it got him here. Because it seemed like there was just a thing that he wanted to go find out, which I totally get, um, but that didn't snowball into something bigger that made him stay. There was that sort of stuff. It wasn't the content, actually, of the last couple of scenes. That I thought was like riveting. And P.S., him dying by his dead sister putting a towel over his face yeah. is fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the one of the sweetest stage deaths, I think, ever. <laughs> So, so that stuff didn't bother me. It was, it was when I was enjoying and watching that, I was like, wait, but I don't... The only reason I can't really get it all the way into this is because I wasn't quite sure why Hank was doing all that because I remember it not being clear to me. Go ahead. Um, to add on to that, um, I think the, the closest thing that I got from what, uh, what the problem was to begin with was this feeling of being a misfit. And what's really interesting, like the, remember, I'm like, oh wait, like this is where he's from. Is that moment with um, with Hank and Henry and um, Billy on the porch, and they're just like they're like engaging in what they would normally do, and it's just like riding a bicycle, and um, and then you know, and Billy is from this entirely different world, and so I feel like at that moment I retroactively understood that he just doesn't feel comfortable. He thinks he's comfortable, but he's not actually. That comfortable and you know being unemployed and whatnot may have stirred up whatever he was allowing to sink. I think that maybe perhaps it would be more useful to see to really <coughs> see that restlessness in the beginning of the play. And that might help sort of as uh, the audience understand that trajectory to like how we get to this point, how important it is to know everything about where you came from. Yeah. Thank you. I go next to the um, I, I felt similarly. I felt there was a, a kind of a aggressiveness to his character. It, it seemed like um, there were different uh, junctures in the narrative where he could have said, okay, I've kind of found out enough. People have given me enough support. But he often said, no, I have to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, and um, 
I, I don't know if that's the sort of thing where you would want to um, give more kind of explication for why he's he, he has this hunger to, to like really tear up all of these roofs around him. But it, it just seems sort of it, it, it seemed like one could just take it as a characterization of this person and what he would do. Just I, I don't know. He could have just um, well, it's kind of like the the, the beginning of. Um, uh, Merchant of Venice is kind of odd because uh, that, that that play actually begins on kind of <coughs> odd where someone says, oh, I feel like doing this. I, I forget what the, sorry, the specific plot point, but the, the opening scene of that is kind of someone has a win and it kind of kicks off this big sequence of events that um, pulls in all these other characters. And so I think it's legitimate to do that. So, um, sorry, I'm rambling a little. It, it was just kind of a curious point that um, he was so determined throughout. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll go with Sue and then um, Rachel. Oh, I was just, um, I don't know if you see me raise my hand. I was taking it, I mean, the beginning when he's um, in the condo with Billy, and he was talking about just the fake feeling of life and the emptiness and, and, and paying people to put in air conditioners and, and that whole world just felt fake and that he wanted to go back to his roots, back to the land and the earth and the mother, the mother of being birth, and just getting back to that. So I, I didn't have a problem with him just suddenly, you know, waking up, you know, just sort of saying, wait a minute, this, this is a fake world I'm living in. Thank you. Yeah. I looked at it as Hank just doesn't fit anywhere. You know, he doesn't fit in the city. He doesn't fit in the country. You know, I think he's trying so hard to find a place where he can. Um, and that's why he's doing so much digging, because he thinks that if he, it's almost like if he can find that one missing piece, that one thing that he can figure out his place. Um, and I don't remember the line that the mother said. Um, she said something about how, like, you're not quite a city boy, you're not quite a country boy. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, but I think she said something, something somewhat similar. She said he has a place. You think? In a pine box. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do remember a specific line where it's like, he doesn't fit. Saying like you don't know why we I never understood why they sent a city boy with no work clothes. Yeah. Like something, yeah, around that where I, I think I don't remember. Anyway, um, but that idea of not belonging and so desperately wanting to, um, and I think that his writing is like what his common thread is is that that's the only thing he feels like is a part of him. But even that, he's starting to lose a grasp on. Um, because if he doesn't have a job, he's not getting anywhere with it. You know, his boyfriend keeps saying, write a novel, and he's not, he's not doing anything with his life. So I think that this is his way to, to find, to, uh, like, kind of, I like the root, the root imagery, and, and the idea that, right, he's floating. You know, he's constantly floating throughout this play, floating from scene to scene, person to person. And he's trying to find those roots that can actually ground him somehow to make him feel like he's a person and that he belongs and deserves to be a person here on this earth. Thank you. Let's use that as a jumping point to start and discuss where he thinks he comes from at first. So we have JP as a character and we have Alice Ann as a character. What do you think as an audience that JP and Alice Ann want and need in this play? Go ahead. I'm actually a little unclear on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that I could that kind of glean was that they, the only reason that we could see them, the only reason that they existed after death, was because of Hank. That's all I could understand. That's the only reason why they're there. Because something in him is keeping them there. I didn't, I didn't feel like uh, they chose to be there. It felt like he 
in whatever worldly way it happened or otherworldly way it happened, the fact that he was not yet resolved in something kept them there. So that kind of um, fogged for me their, their wants and desires. I know they wanted to help him, but I wasn't really sure how. And that was like kind of the only thing that I could really get was that they, they their soul, the only reason that they existed was for him to help him with something. And, I, and then I, at the end, I guess it's to find out the truth. But, but during the course of it, I wasn't quite sure why they were there. Thank that wasn't you. a bad thing, though. Yeah, actually, that leads me to something that I just I didn't realize until now. I I was not. It was appeared to me that JP was dead. Yes. I thought he was still alive. Also, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because she says there's a plot space next to him, so presumably he had to be buried. Mm-hmm. And deep grave. So I thought he had just deserted him and somehow came mm-hmm. back. I don't. I didn't know how. Yeah. Okay. Do you come? Did somebody raise your hand back there? Am I seeing ghosts? Yes. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Given how rich and complicated the conversations among the various men in the play are, it's really surprising how platitudinous the conversations with Alice Ann are. In her, she mostly says, look at you. I thought you did a great job with what you had. <laughs> um, but he, she's how can't got here. And there's not much between them other than this kind of <clears throat> affectionate mother-son, no anger, no, not, not even very profound questioning. So I'm surprised how little happens there. Even though she's dead, I mean, she, she could say anything. Thank you. Did you speak to I actually really liked how she sort of reassured maybe Hank that she didn't confirm or deny anything. And I think it's really hard to write a dead character who isn't either the complete guiding hand or like is because Hank is completely crazy. Um, I think she did a really good job of being, of offering offering guidance in a sense that it wasn't it wasn't completely guiding him, it wasn't directing his behavior and it wasn't making him it wasn't pushing him into the crazy realm, which is really hard for a dead character to create. So I thought that was really good. So that's all I have. <laughs> Rachel. Sorry for talking so much. But I I see well I saw JP and Alice as like, you know, the angel and the devil on the on the two shoulders where it's like Alice keeps saying, this is where you belong, you know, JP's your father, be nice to Henry. And JP's like, oh, you're never going to get an answer to your question, you can keep digging, you know, and that kind of fuels his fire. She, pla- she um, pla- pacifies, is it classified? It's not pacifies, and he riles up. Um, and I feel as if JP, what he wants, is what Hank most wants, is that thirst for knowledge. Because JP kept saying, even in the scene with him now, it's like, just tell me, you know? Like, I can do the math, just tell me. And not getting that answer is maddening. Um, So that's what I felt was JP's want, but that's like Hank's deepest desire as well. So in a way, you know, the guy who raised him is kind of like his father as well. He has, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. but, um, I, you know, I, I, I did think the Ellis character was kind of bland and idealized, but I also felt that she was weirdly cold and detached at the same time. And, and that, in the end, I thought was a rather wonderful characterization of a loving, dead person. You know? <laughs> 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 so I, I feel like you, you hit a note that act, that actually feels right to me for that character. So before we wrap things up here, do you have any final questions for the audience, John, that may have come to you over the course of our discussion? <clears throat> um, well, Monica, you actually sort of bumbled. 
<laughs> you said you felt uncomfortable with Hank and um, Alison's relationship. Yeah, I did. I think it's a little bit um, like we're left at the end where his only real connection is with his dead mother. I mean, it's, that's like a little fucked up for a wrong They uh, were kind of commentary on the structure of the play as well. Um, you know, the idea that <clears throat> you know the protagonist, you know, he has to get his birthright, but he also must engage in a certain group, you know, a certain set of labors. Yeah, but but you know the, the, that. There's the, the you know cleaning of the uh, Hercules has the cleaning of the stalls that he has to do. So, mm -hmm. uh, but you know the idea that there are the labors. The idea is that you know because it's already set up. It's it's not so much that oh there's a big revelation of a mystery at the very end of the play and that we're all going to be shocked. No, it's already been laid out very early on. Uh, we just actually have to get the con the final confirmation. Uh, because you know when when the ancient Athenians were seeing Sophocles' new play Oedipus Rex, you know, <laughs> Oedipus Tyrannus, it's not like oh my God, I had no idea I was going to end like that. You know, they they did it, but there was already they already knew. Mm -hmm. There's lots of foreshadowing in Sophocles, uh, but the point was that you were able to take all these illusions. And it was representing much of the structure. These things that were finally going, we were finally going to get a confirmation. Thank you. And in the back here, I think the piece I'll be left pondering the most about is the way in which incest at the end was naturalized. Not to say mm -hmm. trivialized, but almost. 
And given that it's such a universal and profound taboo, I'm sure that was an important, I mean, it was the theme of the play. And yet it was primarily something to laugh a little nervously about and you know, not that much different than the sow laying over on the piglets. Mm -hmm. um, but we are in a genetic age where you know, I think somehow it's connected to the flatness of the female character in the play, that it's mm -hmm. such a minor thing in the end to reveal that this incest did in fact occur. But, but it's not tragic like the Greek plays. It's just something that happened. That's what I'll ponder. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, with that, we're going to wrap up our questions, but John will be hanging out here, and I'm sure he would love to talk to you about his play. So thank you very much, and let's have a final round of applause for Matt and Thank you. Amen.